Hi, I'm Brett Lee. Tonight on Cricket Legends, Crash talks to one of the greatest legends of all. Before our guests rose to fame in the early 1990s, leg spin was a dying art. Suddenly, every young boy wanted to bowl it because the deeds of a man who turned the game on its head. With 708 wickets, he stands alone on top of Australia's test wicket takers, and it was one of my highlights to play alongside of him for Australia. He is, of course, Shane Warne, and he is a cricket legend. Well, welcome, Warney. Yeah, thanks for having me, Crash. We've had a lot of cricketers on this show, a lot of famous ones, but you're the only one who's had a musical done in their <laughs> order, the famous Eddie Perfect musical. What was it actually like going to a musical in your own honour? Um, odd, uh, weird. The first scene was me in a beanbag with a slab of beer, drinking beer with my mum vacuuming around it, and I went, how the hell does he know that? That's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite weird watching your life um, in a musical. I suppose, uh, you know, your career's had so many big moments, hasn't it? But the biggest mm. one was the ball of the century. Mm. It, it defined you almost as a cricketer. Did it change your life? Yeah, it did crash. Um, you know, I'd been playing first-class cricket for three years or so. I'd played a couple of years of test cricket. Um, you know, I think I was 23 years of age. Against the old enemy, England, coming in to bowl my first ever ball to Mike Gatting, the best player of spin. And it was just one of those balls that came out of the hand nicely. Just drifted, spun, Gatting missed it. And um, I think the euphoria after that, um, he, at the time, you just thought, oh, it was a good delivery. Like, oh, right, who's in next? Let's... And it just sort of grown, just kept getting replayed and replayed that ball. And then, you know, got known as the ball of the century, the best ball ever bowled. But, yeah, it, did, it definitely did change my life. They say that fame never comes on your terms. And less than a year later, you went to South Africa yep. and you had a little mini meltdown, a, a bit of a clash with Andrew Hudson. And mm. you gave an interview where you said... I'm burning up inside, I'm struggling. And it mm. was uh, just an insight into a guy who'd been swamped with it, wasn't mm. it, really? Well, there's no school you go to um, to learn how to handle it all. And it's not, it wasn't just, um, you know, going to a cricket ground, sign a few autographs for the fans, do a press conference, uh, you know, and then you go to a hotel room and get left alone. I would go somewhere for dinner and there'd be four snappers following me or cars following you trying to run you off the road. And I think that sort of 18-month period... I just was struggling how to handle it all. I, I think I became a bit of a big head at times too. Um, and I just, I, I could feel myself building up. And um, anyway, I got Hudson out. And Andrew Hudson is the nicest guy you'll ever meet, you know. And I just gave it to him. Just told him where to go and followed him halfway down the ground. And at times I feel it's like I'm looking at myself. It's not me. It's like there's two different people. Um, there's the, the cricketer and then there's me, the person. You're like a performer. You're an entertainer. You go out in the field and suddenly you change into someone else. And, of course, people probably don't realise that you played third grade for St Kilda and then within two years played a test. You must have turned up at the ASCG and half the blokes, I suppose, <laughs> would have struggled to, to almost know who you were. Exactly. I was standing there in my cricket coffin and Bruce Reid came out who was super tall and I said, oh, up, uh, Mr Reid, Shane Warne. Um, uh, Jeff Marsh, uh, good on Mr Marsh, Shane Warne. So I had to introduce myself to a lot of the team. Cricket wasn't your first choice, was it? You, no. you dreamt of being an AFL player yep. and then must have had that seminal moment where you realised, ah, oh, I'm gone. Yeah, well, I had a letter uh, from St Kilda Footy Club saying that your services are no longer required at the club after being there for nearly three years. Um, and that was my dream shattered. A mate of my Ricky Goff, said, uh, how would you like to, why don't you have a year off footy and um, come and play cricket in England? And I said, you know what, why not? Uh, I went over 79 kilos. Uh, I played five or six games a week and I came back 99 kilos. I put on 20 kilos 20. in six months, yeah. And speaking of yourself as a young player, how have young players changed in their priorities? Do you see it? Uh, I, think the, I think the game's changed a lot and the attitude of the players has changed a lot. Um, I think still everyone wants to be the best they possibly can, but... It, in what area is that? You know, what's the most important thing for them? I think for cricket lovers like us, Crash, all we can do is hope um, that cricketers always want to be the best they can and test themselves in the toughest arena. That's test match cricket. We, we have to do something about test cricket. If we don't do something about test cricket, um, it's, going to be, it's not going to be here. It's going to, and it's going to happen quicker than you think.
Let's go back to your first test at the SCG. You took one for 150 and it took a long while or a little while for your self-esteem to, to build, didn't it? You admit that in those early years it wasn't just a matter of flicking a switch, was it? No. Um, as I've just, you know, one of the biggest chapters in my book was um, about be being told you're not good enough. Um, you know, being told you're not good enough, that you dreamed to be an AFL football, that you weren't good enough. And then, you know, your first test match getting, as you say, one for 150 and starting to think, well, I'm not good enough for this either. And so I'm pretty proud of myself and my family, that my mum and dad supported me so well, my brother, um, and myself to keep going, you know, to not give up. And I think, you know, I played, I think when you watch me play, you could just see that I never, ever gave up. I just always thought we could win. I'd like to think that I inspired a lot of people that I played with, um, played against, and youngsters that played because... You know, I, I like to play with passion. You had a great relationship, didn't you, with your mentor, Terry Jenner? Yep. And, and you were an intriguing couple, weren't you? He'd had a tough <laughs> life, he'd been to yeah. jail, and he almost said that you came along as a, as a gift for, in his life to revitalise him. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just click with people. You know, it could be, for whatever reason, um, you just click with people. And I clicked with TJ straight away. I wouldn't have done anything near as good as what I would have done. My whole career, if I didn't have his support, um, and if I didn't have his uh, mentor through the whole of my career, I would have really struggled. And at times he'd give it to you, front and centre, oh, wouldn't yeah, he? Like, absolutely. remember once I rang him, he said, I've just absolutely. had a bit of a blue with Warney. I've <laughs> said to him, what sacrifices have you made for That's cricket? It. And he's gone on a water diet, drinking water. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I do. It was Merv Hughes was getting married and I drank water at his wedding. Uh, I went on a fitness kick. I, dro I, I, I drove from Melbourne to Adelaide and I was going to surprise TJ. And I stopped out of a bottle shop and um, bought a slab of beer and two bottles of wine, one to give to Rod Marsh and one to give to Terry Jenner. And so I, I did it. I dropped, knocked on his door and had the slab. He goes, what are you doing here? I said, oh, mate, I'll just come over. I don't need to chat about stuff. We're going to Sri Lanka. Um, and he goes, righty -o. well, you can put those beers away, put them in a car, you can drop them back tomorrow. Actually, put them in my fridge, but we're not having any. <laughs> he said, first of all, how about getting fit? He said, so many people have played this game and deserve to play test cricket. You don't deserve to play. What have you done to deserve? You played half a dozen first-class games. You just gave it to me. He said, uh, you're going to get fit. You're going to get off the grog. Um, and he said, you're going to learn about test cricket. I said, I'm an AFL footballer, mate. I, I want to know about all VFL back then. And he said, um, well, test cricket didn't start in 91, 92 when you started. There's a bit of history before that and you're going to get to know it. So I started watching a lot of stuff and listening to him talking about things and I got to know a few of those guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the history of the game is really important for young players to understand. One of Terry Jenner's great quotes, he said, Shane will inspire thousands of kids to bowl leg spin, but there's every chance we won't get many at test level. And he was right. What made you special? Mm. First of all, leg spin is hard. Um, the second point is about seeing young kids and inspiring young kids. I think a lot of people experiment with leg spin. What happens is they'll all do it to about 15 or 16 and that's when you need the love of the captains and coaches. And that's why I wish shield cricketers, first class cricketers, would get back to the schools and get back and help out the young kids at schools. Because if you get those guys helping you and getting specific coaching, just a tip here or there can really make a difference. It was early in those years you, you brought up mystery balls, didn't you? <laughs> Was it all bluff and bluster, and do you, or, or was there a method to it? Uh, there was always a method behind it, because if someone says that, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. But there's just that small element, was there? Yeah. Has he? As a leg spin bowler, you have natural variation. That's our biggest weapon. And if I bowled a leg break that went straight or did something different, they go, hang on, I haven't seen that. What, what, that was something different. And so it just created a little bit of doubt with them. Um, the only time I ever did come up with a delivery was in um, 2000 when I went and played cricket for Hampshire. Uh, they used a juke ball and it had that lacquer on it. And young kids, I think a lot of people experiment with leg spin. What happens is they'll all do it to about 15 or 16 and that's when you need the love of the captains and coaches. And that's why I wish shield cricketers, first class cricketers, would get back to the schools and get back and help out the young kids at schools. Because if you get those guys helping you and getting specific coaching, just a tip here or there can really make a difference. It was early in those years you, you brought up mystery balls, didn't you? <laughs> was it all bluff and bluster? And do you, or, or was there a method to it? Uh, there was always a method behind it. Because if someone says that, they go, oh, yeah, whatever. But there's just that small element, was there? 
Yeah. Has he? As a leg spin bowler, you have natural variation. That's our biggest weapon. And if I bowled a leg break that went straight or did something different, they go, hang on, I haven't seen that. What, what, that was something different. And so it just created a little bit of doubt with them. Um, the only time I ever did come up with a delivery was in um, 2000 when I went and played cricket for Hampshire. Uh, they used a juke ball and it had that lacquer on it and it was so cold and wet over there I couldn't grip the ball properly. And so I changed the seam. I remember Alan Border in 92 telling me, just try ones with the seam going down rather than across. So like, I'll show you a crash. So you normally hold a leg break with a, like, like that with the seam. So I held it like that. And then instead of um, when I tried to bowl a leg break, it would just go down and went straight. And I went, oh, hang on, that's pretty good. <laughs> so I, that was how I came up with the old slider. India was interesting to you because remember in the early years, mm. it was a food thing, wasn't it? Because you're a spaghetti ball in the things, house. Yes, a lot of things. <laughs> but you did get used to India, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, was that a difficult process? Yeah, I struggled. I think all of us struggled at times in India. It took me a few tours to understand how it all works. And then a love of India came. Uh, we won in 2004, then going to do the IPL in 2008. There was a lot of pressure and expectation that we lose our first game. And everyone's going, what the hell have the Royals done? Um, to then go on and win that tournament was something I'm very, very proud of. Um, one of my best achievements in the game because as captain coach, I, you know, the buck stopped with me. And um, everyone that played in that time, I think had a good time too. You're one of the few people who sort of knew Sachin Tendulkar, yep. who to the rest of the world was a complete mystery man. Yeah. Uh, what's he sort of like? Um, he's very quiet. He's quite funny. You know, he doesn't give much of himself in the public, um, but at his home, I've been over to his home a few times. I still think it was a tactic from his in one of the years. I can't remember if it was 98 or 2001. We are playing a test match. Uh, and he said, why don't you come over for dinner and come say hello to the wife and all that. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. So... In India, they eat late, right? So the test match finishes. It's like 50 degrees. I've bowled 40 overs, been smashed all over the park, sitting back in the hotel room, having a dart, going, oh, I really want to go to Sachin's for dinner, but I, can't, I have to go. So about 10 o'clock, I'd get the cab over to his place. Wouldn't eat till about 12. I'm sitting there sort of giving it this one, falling asleep. By about 2 o'clock, he goes, well, how about I drive you? There's not much traffic in Mumbai now. I can take you for a drive. So spin his car, go fast. I get back to the hotel at 4. The alarm would wake up at 7. I'm like this. Next day, get smashed all over, <laughs> over the park again. So I reckon it was a tactic of Satchins to get me out late at night. It's just from out of space or something, and really is ridiculous. It's just a comment that I'll say to another cameraman standing right next to me, and an effects mic has picked it up. Strikes me that Joe the cameraman is in fact Joe the Patsy. The most disappointing thing about it is all the facts are out there. Joe has admitted that he said it, which, uh, you know, it's obviously been pretty tough for him as well as myself, and very tough for Scotty. Don't ask Scotty, it's my cameraman Joe. Can't bowl and you can't throw. One of the most bizarre things uh, of your career was the Joe the Cameraman incident. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Scott Muller mm. uh, was allegedly sledged with the can't bowl, can't throw yeah. taunt. And uh, you were accused of it. Then Joe Privatira, the Channel yeah. 9 cameraman, owned yeah. up. But I remember you were hugely stressed by it, weren't you? I was annoyed. And, and I didn't do it. Yeah. And I, you know, people still think I did it. Did you ever settle it with him no. at the end? The last time all I heard from him was uh, he was bagging me saying, how's the vice captain of Australia, Shane Warne? sledging me and all this sort of stuff. I didn't say it. And if I did, I'd own up to it. But I never said it. Leg spinners are a great club, aren't they? I noticed when you walked in here, your eyes straight away went to Richie, <laughs> shirt unbuttoned, yeah. you know? And he was always there in the background of your career, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. He, Richie was a guy that... Um, he sort of... We were his kids. You know, he looked after us. He was the... We all looked up to Richie. I remember uh, 96, I did my finger. And... Um, uh, Austin Robertson, who was my manager at that time, said, oh, look, Richie's been in contact and he's got some, um, you know, he's got a few tips for you. And uh, I said, oh, really? What's he said, no, no, you've got to ring him. He's in, he's in France. You've got to give him a buzz. I said, oh, OK. So I've got this number. So I wait to the right time to ring. And I ring and uh, as I ring the phone, answers it goes, sir, hello. I went, oh, Richie, it's uh, Shane Warne here. He goes, no, hang on. I went... <laughs> 
Hello. I said, oh, Richie. Yes. He said, he's pretending to be the butler. It's like, mate, you don't need to pretend to be the butler. There's not too many people with your voice. <laughs> so it's it a dead uh, giveaway straight away. Oh, it was quite funny, yeah. But he, yeah, he made me laugh. He made me laugh. What about the captains you played under? I mean, when you first started on the border, it almost like mm. a father and son sort of thing, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, AB, uh, I think for all of us, was sort of the granddad uh, of Australian cricket. You know, what he taught us, the toughness he brought to us, he didn't let us get away with anything. You know, he forgets now about all the serves he used to give us and all that sort of stuff, the sprays. And you know, I remember Heels putting his bat on ice once in South Africa. You think it's funny, do you? You know, like he just nailed us. Really? All the time. And, um, you know, I think after he sort of, the toughness and the team that he established, this is what Test cricket means. This is what it's about. Mm. Um, and then Mark Taylor, after that, took it to another level. Yes, he took over a great team. But Alan Border was just, a, you know, it was fantastic too. We really needed him at that time. What about Ponting and War? Because one of your quotes was they were mainly fast bowlers captains, yeah. where spinners were sort of an afterthought. Is that yep. correct? Yeah. What Steve War inherited under Mark Taylor was a fantastic team. In 2000, I think, or 2001, Gilly comes in and Brett Lee comes in. Mm. And then Gillespie's back from injury. So suddenly we've got Brett Lee, Jason Gillespie and McGrath. And so the whole our attitude changed mm. of how we're going to win test matches, which I could totally understand. Yeah. But it was a change of mindset that took me a little bit of time to understand. And Ricky was the same. But with Stephen, you're on record, you thought he was a selfish player. Yeah. Is, is, is you stand by that? Absolutely. He was the most selfish cricketer I played with. But I think that helped him into being a good batsman. You know, that's why I think he got the most not outs in, in test cricket. Because yeah. it was like, over my dead body am I getting out? You know, you're not getting me out. And he was more of a, um, a match saver. You're not going to like everyone you play with. Steve, uh, Steve Waugh and I were very close friends in Zimbabwe and great mates. But then, um, you know, when he got back in the side, he changed. And then over the years, I just saw different things that I didn't like. Did it... Uh, create a wedge between you that you're both candidates for the Australian captaincy, with the selectors recommending you and the board overruling them for Stephen? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, people say, you know, we wish you had been captain of Australia. To me, it had nothing to do with whether I liked Steve Waugh or not. He got the captaincy, I was vice-captain. Um, didn't, that didn't affect me, uh, which is contrary to what people think. Some of the players in the West Indies, when he first took over, said, can you please chat to the captain? Um, is you, that right? Yeah, can you chat to him about some field placements and things like that? A few of the players were frustrated at that time with his captaincy mm -hmm. and I said, I'm his vice-captain mm -hmm. and if you've got a problem, you've got a Steve Waugh, I'm backing my captain. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, he probably never knew about how much I supported him to some of those players. What about coaches? Bob Simpson took a terrific interest in you, didn't he? Simo was great. I think he's probably the best all-round cricket coach that I've I played under. We, we had him at a great time. Uh, he showed me that around the wicket could be a huge um, weapon. This was, what, 91, uh, 92 season. And um, the old bloke, the coach, he starts, you know, tweaking a few. I said, I'm going to smack him that far out of the park. He got me out about two or three times from around the wicket, stumped. And I said, OK, tell me more about this around the wicket. And then he's, you know, talk about angles and alignment and all different types of things. And um, then 92, 93 in New Zealand, I, I sort of used it a bit. And then in England in 93, I used it a lot and um, it became a, a pretty good weapon. So you had a great rapport with him, but with mm -hmm. John Buchanan, it was different, wasn't it? You yep. just never seemed sold on his methods? No. I remember the first meeting, he said, uh, we're all sitting around in the first meeting as Australian coach. He said, look, my, what I'm going to do with you guys, I'm really looking forward to the challenge, but I'm going to improve you as people. So I sort of put my hand up, being that guy, and said, mate, what's your title again? And he said... Australian cricket coach. I said, well, you just stick to coaching, we'll be OK. But he couldn't coach, and that's why he had to worry about other methods. And some of his methods, I could understand the reasoning about trying to fire you up and do things like that, but he went the wrong way about it because he had no people skills. He'd use a bit of divide and conquer and say, hey, Warnie, what about Crash? He's not really training that well. Then he go to Crash and Crash, Warnie's not really training that well. Just come up and say, mate, I'm not happy with the way you're doing it at the moment. But he never did that. He never, ever came to your face and said it, ever. And he'd always go round about doing or through the press or to other players. What about your relationship with Adam Gilchrist, which has been yep. the, the subject of enormous, you know, debate over the years? Because he often felt that your, your great friendship with Darren Berry yep. probably got between you, in, in a sense. No, 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 not at all. Mm. Um, Gilly and I, um, we got along fine. I don't know where it all started from about how we didn't like each other. That's just not true. Mm. Um,
we get along fine. I enjoy catching up with Gilly. But I, I don't think it was because of any one particular heels or Chuck or anything like that. Maybe he felt that because I was pushing Chuck. You were lucky to have to have an audience with Kerry Packer at times, weren't you? Tell you what I did, I gave Kerry Packer my first ever baggy green. Did you really? Uh, yeah, he did a lot for me. That's a remarkable story, wasn't it? Yeah, so that? I, yeah, I How gave did he Kerry... react? Oh, he was blown away. I mean, what do you give Kerry Packer? You know, so, you know, he looked after me a lot and uh, was always had my back, basically. One of the most remarkable instances of your career was when Sally Malik yeah. invited you to his room and offered you $200,000 to bowl poorly. Mm. That must have been extraordinary. Yeah, it was. It was 94, Mark Taylor's first test match as captain. And we were 300 and something runs ahead going to the last day. And I was rooming with Tim May. And um, the phone rings in the room and I pick it up. Hello. I get, Shane, it's um, Sally Malik. I said, hello. He said, yeah, I'm, we're staying in the same hotel. Um, would you like to come upstairs and have a quick chat with me? And I went, Jesus, OK. So I hung the phone up and Tim May said, oh, who was that? I said, I was the rat. We used to call him the rat, <laughs> out of pure coincidence, because we reckon he looked like a rat. That was the only, just his facial, nothing, no other reason. Anyway, I get to his room and um, I sit down. And he goes, uh, thanks for coming up. I said, sure, mate, what can I do for you? And he said, we can't lose tomorrow. I said, well, you know, 300 runs, a big day, it's starting to turn. I took five in the first, Maisie's starting to spin it. A bit of reverse swing, I think, you know, I think you're going to have your, it's going to be tough, should be a good day's cricket. And he said, no, no, we can't lose. I'm sort of thinking, have I missed something here or what? What do I, I, said, I've just, I said, mate, as I said, we're going to bloody beat you tomorrow. And he goes, no, no, what you're not understanding is we cannot lose tomorrow. I said, right, what do you mean? And he said, well, our houses will get burnt down. You know, I said, well, well I, I can't control that. I'm sorry. But um, we're going to, you know, whoever wins, may the best side win tomorrow. But is that what you wanted to talk about? He goes, no, no, we can't lose tomorrow. And what I mean by you can't lose tomorrow is if I give you and Tim May 200000 US dollars each, I'll be in your room in half an hour, and all I want you to do is just bowl wide of off stump and a match will be a draw. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? He said, I can put 200000 US cash. Remember, at this stage, our contracts were... Five grand, maybe yeah. ten grand with Cricket Australia. Yeah. Um, so two hundred thousand US was a lot of money. Yeah. And um, I said, mate, I, I, I don't know what, you, I, no way, and we're going to beat you tomorrow. And I sort of went out of the room, and I went down to Tim May, and I said, he said, what did the rat want? I said, mate, you're not going to believe this. He said, he wants to give us two hundred thousand US each to bowl wide of off stump. And he goes, mate, I don't know, get paid to bowl like that. <laughs> I said, no, Typical don't, Maisie. don't worry. And so anyway, so we went to Mark Taylor. We told Mark Taylor. We told Bob Simpson, who then told John Reid, who was the match referee uh, for the ISIS from New Zealand. Yep. He goes, oh, my, what, what is going on? And then the next day, um, I got down to three runs to win. The last wicket, Inzamam and Mushtaq put on about 50 each, a 50 partnership or something. And it was three runs to win. And Mark Taylor came up to me and said, Rightio, what are we doing? I said, what about we have no one on the onside? Just have a sweeper out there and a bat pad. Leave everyone, no mid on, no mid wicket, no square leg, no no one. I bowl just leg breaks at leg stump, try and rip him and let him see if he wants to hit it through the onside. Hopefully he'll nick one um, to what, you know, slips and all that stuff. He said, OK, let's go with it. So I bowled a couple of good ones and he played and missed a bit and then... He just sort of fell out of his crease and tried to hit it through mid-wicket, missed it outside the bat, went through heels as legs, went four byes, we lose the test match. Anyway, I got man of the match, walk up to collect the man of the match trophy and Malik, as I pass him, said, should have kept the cash, shouldn't you? Really? Yeah. And I'm like, I just wanted to punt. Like, you know, I was yeah. just like, come on, mate. You rebutted him, but you got then caught in the controversy with John the bookie for taking money for information. And that was something you said at the time. I think you said naive and stupid mm. because, you know, you weren't aware of, of, of what you were getting into. Well, one, I didn't know as a bookmaker. Yep. As a friend of Mark Wars. I lost five grand at the casino and he said, here's $5,000 that you lost last night at the casino, no strings attached. I spoke to him twice on the phone, uh, wished me uh, Merry Christmas and didn't really think anything else of it. And so down the track, I find out that he was a bookmaker. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. I didn't know that. So... 
Um, yeah, that, that was a pretty ordinary time and you know, I learnt my lesson from that. One capacity you've always had, Warney, is to put any sort of issues aside and just bowl well. I remember in 2005, you just split with Simone and I kept on hearing you were so sad after Stump, still mm. grieving mm. Uh, over your marriage. Yep. Terry Jenner said, if Warney takes 15 wickets this series, it'll be a miracle. And you, mm. you end up taking 40. It was extraordinary, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was... Um... One of those, I mean, it was a fantastic series of cricket, that one in the 2005. England were the better side and they deserved to win, but it was a fascinating series. And for me, for my personal stuff, it was really tough. Um, I felt, I'd let, as a parent, I'd let my children down. Uh, Simone and I, had, you know, we'd been, weren't going that great for a, a period of time before that, for various... When he takes 15 wickets this series, it'll be a miracle. And you, mm. you end up taking 40. It was extraordinary, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was... Um, one of those, I mean, it was a fantastic series of cricket, that one in the 2005. England were the better side and they deserved to win, but it was a fascinating series. And for me, for my personal stuff, it was really tough. Um, I felt, I'd let, as a parent, I'd let my children down. Uh, Simone and I, had, you know, we'd been, weren't going that great for a, a period of time before that for various reasons. And um, we'd sort of, we just made it work for the kids. And I remember before the first test match, TJ came down the day before and um, he said, how are you going? I said, I'm struggling, really struggling. I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm upset. Uh, as a father, I've let my kids down big time um, and uh, my bowling's not going great. He said, OK, well, we're going to leave you and get one part right, and that is your bowling. I said, OK. So I think we... St I don't know exactly, but it would have been at least four, five, maybe six hours. I don't know how many balls I bowled in that time, but I was I was exhausted. And you shouldn't do that the day before a test match. But I walked away before that first test match at Lord's, out in the nursery ground, I walked away from that going, they're coming out well. I, I finally feel like I, I'm back bowling well. And you know, you couldn't do that today. Sports science would run out and say, no, 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 you can't do that. And sports science, I mean, that's another... We need a whole episode for that uh, crash, but... Is it overrated, sports science? Yeah. I, I think there's a place for sports science in all sport, but not as the go-to. Your brain, common sense is first, and then sports science can back it up. And, and as you look back, Warney, what's your favourite memory? Is there one that stands out, just that one golden moment? Oh, I was very lucky to have a lot of those crash with the team, you know, winning World Cups, winning Ashes series, uh, MCG in front of 90,000, taking your 700th, getting... I mean, I've been lucky, Crash. You know, I played in an era of Australian cricket that was, you know, as good as any year of Australian cricket, really. I'm very thankful for my life. I, I love being a parent. I've got three amazing children. I'm happy. I love being involved with some of my stuff that I'm doing. But, you know, I love my children more than anything else. They're great memories, Warney. I know if the great Richie's still looking <laughs> down on us, he would say, you enriched the game, you were one of the game's greatest players and you changed it forever. Well played, a true cricket legend. Thanks very much for having me, Crash. Thank you.